is Carrie, chapter 7, part 2 of chapter 7. Of course, the president didn't pay me no attention. I saw him a lot, getting into his coach or sitting at his dinner when the waiters swung the door to the dining room open, but he didn't come into the kitchen. If he wanted something done, he sent his secretary, Mr. Lear, around to tell Mr. Francis, and Mr. Francis would tell us. But once I did talk to the president. One of the delivery boys had spilled a box of strawberries by the side door, and I was out there helping to clean up. As we was doing it, President Washington's carriage came along and stopped so as the president could get out and go in the side door. Me and the delivery boy skipped out of the way. When the president passed us, the delivery boy bowed, and I curtsied as best I could for never having no training in it. Just then, the president's handkerchief fell out of his sleeve. He didn't notice it, but walked on. I jumped forward, picked it up, and caught up with him. Sir, I said. He stopped and looked at me. I held out the handkerchief. Sir, you dropped this. Uh, oh, yes, thank you, he said, in that serious way he had. Who are you? I tried another curtsy, which wasn't no more successful than the first one. Carrie, sir, I come from Mr. Francis's tavern. I see, he said. He patted me on the head, took the handkerchief, and gave me a copper. Then he marched on into the house. That was the only time I talked to him. He looked mighty serious. I figured being president of a brand new country that didn't have no rules yet wasn't no bushel of roses. Of course, I missed the tavern some. I missed Horace and the other waiters, and I even missed the other cooks who was all right in their way, even if they was too bossy and always telling you to look sharp. Horace come around sometimes with a message for Mr. Francis or something, and I usually had a chance to gab with him and get caught up on the news. Whether the third cook had fallen asleep and burned the eggs again, or what famous people had come in for dinner. Sometimes he had news of Dan, too. Dan come around to the tavern whenever he could, same as always. I told Horace, I wished he'd come around and see me too. Well, he probably would, Carrie, but you can't just go dropping by the president's mansion like it was a cow barn. Tell him the president won't mind. There's so much food left over after dinner, the president wouldn't notice if he ate for days. Yes, but Mr. Francis would. Well, tell him anyway, I said. I miss Dan a lot. But aside from that, after I got to know the people around the Cherry Street house, I got comfortable. President Washington had brought up from his plantation in Virginia seven slaves, three for the stables and four to help in the house. The boss of them was old Will Lee, who was crippled in the legs and drank a good deal, but had been George Washington's body servant for just years and years and was mighty close to him. Old Will, he didn't pay no attention to me. I was nothing to him. But some of the others was more friendly, and I'd sit around and chat with them when we ate our supper. They talked a lot about George Washington's plantation, which was called Mount Vernon, and was down in Virginia someplace hundreds of miles away. Leastwise, I suppose it was hundreds of miles away. I didn't know for sure. Oh, they said it was the grandest place with hundreds of slaves and wheat and cornfields as far as you could see and no end of horses and stables and servants. The Cherry Street house wasn't nothing compared to it, they said. They was mighty scornful about New York, too. What's wrong with New York, I said. Oh, New York ain't a fit place to live. It's dirty and noisy and smells so bad you hardly dare breathe. It ain't that bad, I said. You've got to get used to it. Used to it? Why, who could get used to open sewers running down the middle of the streets and dead animals left where they lay and people just walking around them and paying no attention? They don't leave the animals lay, I said. The carters pick them up. Anyway, you ain't got no great buildings like we have and all these fine houses and such. Well, it don't matter, one of the older ones said. We ain't staying here anyway. Well, that surprised me a good deal. We ain't staying here? No, we ain't. 
I got it from old Will that the Congress is aiming to move the government out of New York. No, I said. Not after they spent all that money fixing up City Hall for it. It don't matter. Old Will says we're going. Where to? And he shrugged. They don't rightly know. Philadelphia maybe, Virginia maybe. They ain't decided yet. But old Will says we're going, and he got it from President Washington himself. I didn't know what to think about that. Of course, maybe Mr. Francis wouldn't go, and if he did, maybe he wouldn't take me. But it seemed like old Will said we was all going. I wasn't safe in New York, but I didn't think I'd be any better off in Virginia. Down in Virginia, if I'd done something wrong, which wasn't no more likely to happen than the sun would come up on Wednesday, they might stick me out in the cornfields to hold the rest of my life away. Besides, New York was my home. I was used to it, and I liked it, even if there was dead animals flung around it and Captain Ivers was scouting around for me. On the other side of it, if I was to go someplace else, I would be safe from Captain Ivers, and maybe we'd go to Philadelphia instead of Virginia. Now, Horace, he'd jump at the chance to go to Philadelphia. Sometimes he'd come over to Cherry Street with a message for Mr. Francis from his wife, who was managing the tavern. If, a, if I was out in the dining room gleaming things, he'd slip out there and stare around at the cabinet shelves lined up with silver dishes and the china with the pictures on it and the sconces on the walls and the grandfather clock in the corner that I had to polish once a week. It made his mouth water just to look. He'd say, Carrie... I'm blamed if I can understand how they chose you for this job. I don't mean nothing by that. You do the best you can. But when it comes to setting up a dining room, why, that's meat and drink for me. I've been doing it for years at the most famous tavern in New York, and I can't be beat at it. You'll admit that yourself, Carrie. Well, he hadn't been at it for years, only three years. He'd been a stable boy for ten years before that, and knew more about setting up a stable than a dining room table, so far as that went. But all I said was, oh, I'll admit it, Horace, there ain't much you can't be beat at. And he'd give me a look and say, don't you get sassy with me, Carrie. I don't care if you do work for the president. You ain't supposed to be sassing me.